Hello there. Are you sure you're in the right place? See the name on the door? This podcast is spine chillers and serial killers. Surely you don't want to come in here. You do. Well, I must warn you that things are pretty adult in here. Absolutely no children are allowed. Obscene language, shocking and horrendous stories to chill you to your core, and terrifying tales that'll keep you up at night. The ladies inside aren't quite right. Lovely and hilarious, but very... strange. Still want in, do you? Well, you'll get what you're here for. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this week's Spine Chillers and Serial Killers. I'm Tash. I'm Becky. And I'm Emma. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? We're good. We're good. Right? Yeah. Also good. (laughs) Hang on. That's not far. That's me moving my microphone closer to my face. Oh, it sounded like a chair. Girl. She got some wind. (laughs) To be fair stomach bug going through my house like fucking wildfire so possibly i'm just like dodging dodging shit yeah dodging shit and puke like you're not gonna fucking get me you mingers (laughs) i love being a mother so much yeah it's great it's great yeah and uh no it's just been constant flu stomach bug Uh, to be fair since december i think there has constantly been somebody sick in our house i hear that I think COVID fucked up our immune system. I really do. Oh, undoubtedly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's just life. I'm okay. Becky looks gorgeous. Tash looks fabulous. Thanks. We're gonna have a good we're gonna have a good time tonight, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I have got a bit of a cough, so gonna try and not cough too much. That's all and right. I am gonna have a soother for my oh, throat. Nice. So we get to mm. you suck. <laughs> so some people want to be honest but yeah. we could do like that ASMR. asmr yeah just hear ma oh, i don't know hearing somebody suck is actually quite <laughs> some people gross. think very sexy <laughs> yeah maybe maybe um what was i gonna say i had fun with um one of those podcast promoters again, they were messaging me going, you know, oh, madam, would you like me to podcast promote your podcast very well? You know, that kind of, obviously English wasn't their first language. Yeah. And uh, hang on, I'll, I'll bring it up. I think I'm so fucking funny. Sometimes you are, babe. Sometimes. If I can get uh, 1,500 downloads per day and 45,000 downloads per month and ratings and six plus reviews on your podcast. You will pay me a hundred dollars. You agree? <laughs> you, you will pay me a hundred dollars. You agree? <laughs> it's the way they're so confident. And I know. Like, You'll pay me that one, you hun. Of course you will. Oh, yeah. And I was like, hey, hey there, my bub. That's what his name is, my bub. Yeah. I do if quite all those like downloads. Those are organic how can you guarantee the five star reviews what if they hate the podcast what if we end up with one star ratings because to be honest i could just ask six of my mates to give us a good review for free <laughs> yeah anyway we have six like, friends <laughs> well uh, hang on one two tom australian tom i'm pretty sure he'd give us a review yeah, yeah. Um, I could get your my husband. husband to do it. Yeah, I could get my Rachel. Husband. Rachel will do it. Rachel, my do husband, it. And your, yeah. your husband. Yeah, boom. See, my family uh, as well. They'll do it. Well, why aren't they doing it? We're talking about it, but can we actually get them to do it? Have they not done it? I don't think so. I don't know. Family, fucking rate it. Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, get involved. Anyway, he goes, ma'am. I want to make monthly contract with you. I was like, do you now? <laughs> that sounds like the same involved? kind of, I want to see Bob's and Virgin. I want to make monthly sex with you. <laughs> it kind of <laughs> comes across as the same sort of 
Spiel. Hang on, it gets better. Ma'am, I want to introduce myself, not by words, but by the quality of my work. Ma'am, because your satisfaction is my main goal. And you know what I said? What? That's what he said. (laughs) (laughs) Go on, Em. It sounded quite flirtatious, really, for a podcast promoter. I have a review. A good one, because it sounds not... Yeah, it's a good one. All right. You kind of said, I have a review. I have a review. No, it's a really good one. Sometimes these reviews just pop up and I get emails from things. I don't know how to look at all the reviews. So, when you know, if I don't give you a shout out, it's not done on purpose. But this one did pop up and it's from... Rochelle Cat. So I don't know if that's the same Rochelle that showed me the spooky statues or if it's a different Rochelle. But either way, thank you very much, Rochelle. Thank you. She said, five stars, still the best. It's tough waiting two weeks, which made me so sad because I was like, oh, should we go back to every week just for Rochelle? It's tough waiting two weeks. Your episodes make me happy for a bit. Aww. Go back and listen to them all again. There's nearly a hundred. (coughs) <coughs> sorry about the cough i'm only listening to you, to the other keep it weird podcast the one we were talking about last week um since you took your break but you'll always be my first choice oh rochelle isn't she a sweetie pie she's so sweet thanks rochelle and you're totally allowed to listen to the other keep it weird podcast because it's it's brilliant so right oh Left. i had another thing Go on. I missed that last week. We didn't have the old right left. <laughs> nah. Never gets old. Never gets old. Because I've got oh yeah, I've got a spooky um story to tell you before I get we get into Becky's story. Okay. Because it's not long. Do you want to hear right. it? It's all I want to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have right. I've got no idea where I heard this. Could have been on another podcast. Could have been on a documentary. But it freaked Could've me made it up. out. No, I didn't make it up. It's definitely a thing. No, but you know when you you know when you like are so certain of something, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone told me. What was it I asked you the other day? If putting your pinky up when you were yeah. having a drink made you, meant you had chlamydia or gonorrhea, Lock gonorrhea, right? And I told someone this with such conviction, and then self doubted myself so much. And when then when I asked you, Emma, and you were like, no, I don't know what you're talking about, and then Becky. <laughs> Becky swooped, swooped in. in and saved she the day. saved the day because I honestly was having like some sort of crisis. I was googling it. I was like, "Where have I heard this?" But to be fair, the person that told us could have just made it up, and we believed it because we believe everything. Hook, line, and sinker. Absolutely. I was like, "Yep, that's a fact." Yeah. Well, I've I've never heard of it, but because I just don't know why anybody would want to like sign. It was that back they've in got the day, gonorrhea. back in the day where chlamydia and and everything was a thing, and everyone had it. Uh, and it was like, hey, everyone, if you want to get a bit fristy, just to let you know, I've got gonorrhea. I think it was so the gonorrhea people and then shag I together. attract another gonorrhea person, yeah. and then we make oh. gonorrhea babies, super gonorrhea. Oh, God, a real baby. Oh, God <laughs> <sake>. <laughs> anyway, Emma, you tell us your thing and then I've got something to tell you which will blow okay. your minds. Okay. Right. This I this was just like glitchy in the matrix, fuck with your head type story. Mm-hmm. So this family driving down a road, it's the man, the wife, and their little boy in the back. And they see the exact same car coming towards them, and they're like, Oh, that's funny. Look, it's the exact same car. And they kind of wave you know to the other people because they've got the same car and it's funny and yeah but as they wave the other family just kind of looks at them like in shock and the family that are waving realizes that the people in the other car is them so the man sees himself and the woman sees herself and there's a little lad in the back that looks just like like their kid so they get home and the man, the husband's like, did you see that? And the wife's like, yeah, that was fucking creepy. She looked just like me and he looked just like you. And anyway, it freaked them out, but they kind of just put it down to massive coincidence that these people were wearing the same kind of clothes, the same car, 
They, you know, they just kind of forgot about it. Then, a few months after that, they were going the other direction on the same road and they saw the same car coming towards them. And as they looked into the car, the family in that car were all waving to them and they just looked back really shocked. Like a time loop? Yeah, so a time loop. So that first family that they'd seen in the car was actually them reacting to something that hadn't happened yet. Wow. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Tash enjoyed that. She was like, "What? No, <laughs> that's like yeah. the worst sense of deja vu ever, isn't it?" Can you imagine seeing your entire family Locking. in a car no. twice? Twice, crazy, no, and like. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, ooh. yeah. And that Horrible. family that was staring back at them in shock was actually them, but in the future. Yeah. Mad. Horrible. Mind. Thanks, Emma. Mind bending. Mind bending. Anyway, Tash, what have you got to tell us, darling? Cast your minds back to, to... the club. That song yeah. comes on. She's got them apple bottom jeans, boots, boots with, with the, the fur. fur. With the fur. The whole club is looking at her. She hit the floor. Yep, I'm there. You're I'm in, there. Your interpretation of Boots with the Fur. Describe that outfit to me. Some jeans. Yeah, and she's and wearing boots, boots, boots with, with fur. fur with pom-poms on. <laughs> that was my interpretation of the song. And I believe at one point I even had some boots with fur on. Yeah, with yeah I have boots with fur on. There is, I don't remember what year that song came out. Like but there is now debate. Seven. Yeah. That's what I think. There's now debate that boots with the fur is boots, leather pair of boots, and a fur jacket. No, they're fucking wrong. They weren't living in back in the day. It's Gen Z messing everything up. You weren't there with your Boots in the club with fur on, sweating. (laughs) What do you think? I don't know, because I think in the lyrics of that song, at another point, they talk about a different pair of shoes. So this has come about because the woman, I don't know her name, but the woman that sang um, the national anthem at the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago... Was wearing leather boots and a fur. Posted a picture of herself wearing boots... And a fur coat captioned, Boots like, with the lyrics with the song. Yeah. So then it's been this whole thing of, like... But isn't there another point in the song where they talk about a different pair of shoes? I can't remember the whole song. And Let's also, who look. would be in a club with a fur coat on? It'd be hot. Babe, in 2007, we did some wild shit. I know, but we went out You've got to stand coats. in that queue! You've got to stand in that queue! Yeah, but we never wore anything. We went out we in, in December Sags. basically naked. <laughs> we did. But also, so then also somebody else I know, so I went to work and I like queried everyone that I saw. I was like, what's your interpretation of this song? And um Boots with the Fur, also something with the fur is something that's like top tier. So they there's... There's room for multiple interpretations, basically. Right. In the music video, didn't doesn't she have boots with fur on? Look, them baggy know. sweatpants and the Reeboks with, Reeboks the with the straps. Those Reeboks with the straps. With the strap. She's the Baggy sweatpants and the, the Reeboks big with, booty the strap, slap. with the straps. With the straps. Is that a different girl? Because she's now got sweatpants on and Reeboks. Is that not him that's dressed like that? Sure he had them. So Shorty, or oh, I don't know, like I think it's I'm, different girls. Know. He's just per- just perving on everyone in the club. Like, oh, she's fit. Oh, she's fit. Oh, she's fit. Would maybe, maybe. Well, yeah, I don't know. That's just blown my mind. Don't know. Blow mine. It blew mine as well. So, but I'm. I still. I think boots with the fur is boots with the fur trim around the top. Well, that's why I got my boots with the fur. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, because he says rebots with the straps and boots yeah. with the fur. Ah, see? So it's see? two adjectives for each pair of shoes. He wants shoes. to make sure that we know what type of boot 
And the fact that she doesn't, the other one doesn't need to tie her laces, she has straps. Yeah, we've just solved it. There we go. Oh, I've got to tell you something funny just before we start. Go on, baby. You were gone doing some uh, audio setup earlier and I said me and Becky looked like a pair of vampires. And the reason I said that is because my girls, just before they went to bed, they looked at me and they said, oh, mummy, you look like a vampire. And I was like... Compliment. Yeah, Yeah, I was like completely taking that as a compliment and then ben walked past and said well she fucking sucks the life out of me under his breath <laughs> ben! <laughs> hold on hold on in a sexual way or like uh oh I... god uh, no, i don't think it was a sexual way i think he was being a shit face Oh, oh no, I, I definitely See, thought it was a sexual My head goes way. too sexual, but then I was like, hold on, was he dissing you? I took it as a diss. I took it as a diss. <laughs> but, like, oh, like, I, I initially I, thought, I initially didn't take it as a diss. No, well, my way, mind it was hilarious. took a right turn definitely to the dirty meaning behind that. <laughs> Do you know, knowing him, it might have been that. You have to ask him. Yeah. I ben? didn't. I took it as a diss. But, <laughs> but uh, he's so he's so sharp. He's so quick. He's, you know, such a quiet bloke. And he just like mulls around and then he comes out with these one liners and you're just like. <laughs> Slap. What? Yeah. What? Ben. That was funny. Anyway. Yeah. yeah well played, Ben. Bravo. Yeah. No, I don't have uh, anything to tell you guys apart from the fact that I screamed left at one of my children when they said right and then laughed hysterically because I finally got to someone they were like mum right and I went left left <laughs> <laughs> and they must have thought that I'd gone mental and they were like <laughs> <laughs> just like what are you doing <laughs> I do it all like, the time I get to say it for once and then I thought like I'm what's so out of the funny. room and yeah I think I must put my kids through some stuff sometimes bless them <laughs> That's the only thing that happened to me. It takes everything for me not to say smells after anyone says anyone's name at work as well. Yeah. No, like you call someone's name and then they go smells. Smells. Like, mm. I just, oh. After we did a podcast here the next day at work, some I was on the phone to someone and they shout. They must have shouted their spouse or their husband and they were like, oh no, Greg, Greg. And I was like, Smells. <laughs> and then I was like, <laughs> I had to mute my microphone and have a little snigger. Hmm. And then, yeah. Anyway, such such an we, adult. We, yeah. No, we. Me and Ben, it's in your bum. So when you can't find something, it's like, have you seen the remote control? Is it in your bum? <sighs> and we've always done it. I probably did it when we used to go to the pub. It's in your bum. Yeah. Obviously. Our kids have picked up on it, which is highly inappropriate. So, <laughs> so as now long as you say time... in your bum and not up your ass. It depends what you oh, say. Oh no, it's always in your it's always in your bum. There's nothing oh, like sexy your... about it. I, I don't know. It's just up your bum. Is, and, that, is up your ass sexy? <laughs> <laughs> but up your bum is really <laughs> not. <laughs> no, but I mean, there's no sexual connotation behind it. It's just something we say. And yeah. Uh, yeah, they've started saying it now. And it's a bit shocking when you've got your five-year-old, when you go, do you know where your shoes are, love? She goes, in your bum. Happy, bum. <laughs> Happy, bum. Second shelf. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, our kids are so lucky because they've got awesome parents. They are going to grow up with such awesome personalities. So funny. Yeah, yeah so funny. Oh. And they'll have their own podcast and then the generation will continue. Maybe they'll even podcast together. Maybe. Or yeah. maybe our, our crippling anxiety will stop them from doing it. <laughs> and they will hate us forever and just be like, you fucked up my childhood and now we're paying for therapy bills. No, that's your anxiety speaking. That's it. You know, that won't happen. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're going to be great. They're going to be great. The apple bottom jeans, boots with the fur. I've got that in my head Becky now. now. Yeah, no, we've just lost her for the entire podcast. Sorry. Right. Should we, yeah. you know, podcast about something? Yes. Yeah. We once got a review saying, please, please try and create some content. And it's like, Fuck we've off. just commented. No. 
<laughs> no, but like you've just commented on the fucking content. This is content. Yeah. I think you'll find that you can find that content up your bum. <laughs> up your bum. <laughs> <laughs> Why only that? Some podcasts are literally just this type of thing. At least we have some sort of structure. Yeah, we do. I think we should have another podcast. I had this idea about something called that's gross and every week one of us has a disgusting subject to talk about and we just talk about really minging things. Well, why don't we just have that as a feature on here? How do you guys feel about us having a feature of that's oh, gross? Oh, 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 lifting my hand. Pick me, pick me. Um, Emma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Instead of Tinder with Tash, you should do that's gross with Tinder. Yeah, great. <laughs> great. Right, tell us what you think, people. Oh, yes. Send us in any gross yeah. things. I'll read them out. I'll research them. Um, I'll get some info on where it comes from. I'm setting myself up for, to fail here, yeah. but I will try. No, and every now and again, when we get too grossed out, we could have a, that's wholesome. And you can have a wholesome story. Yeah. Oh, well, I could get two different jingles going. We, instead of the Tinder with Tash jingle, we'll have to have a, that's gross with Tash. And then wholesome time you know i don't know wholesome time with tash with tash <laughs> she's like eh. <laughs> there's so many gross things i've got so many gross things that i can send you <laughs> right shall we uh go on to something a little bit more serious is it me to start this year this week <laughs> <laughs> this year some the point back year. oh yeah it's me. It's just you. It's yeah. just you. Yes, it is you to start, my love. Okay. In the early hours of the 24th of May, 1987, Ken Parks, age 23, arrived at Toronto Police Station shortly before 5am. His body was covered in blood. The on-duty officer noted that he was disoriented and just sort of like wandering around as he approached the front desk. His gaze was fixed on his blood-stained attire, so the person coming into the um, the police station was kind of looking at himself, almost as if he didn't know he was why he was covered in blood, and his hands were trembling. And then with a voice laden with shock and horror, Ken uttered this following confession. He said, I've just killed someone with my bare hands. Oh my God, I've just killed someone. I've just killed two people. Oh my God, I've just killed two people oh with my hands, my hands. Fucking hell. It's unfortunate, isn't it? Well, it's very unfortunate. <laughs> um, it's very like Macbeth, you know, very like, oh, my hands, my hands. But he was just stuttering and almost as if he was realising himself what he's, what's happened. Like he's in shock. Yeah, completely in shock. He says, I've just killed my mother... And father-in-law, I've stabbed and beat them to death. It's all my fault. Father-in-law? Father-in-law. His mother and father-in-law. So his in-laws. Sorry, I thought it was his mother and father-in-law. No, his mother and father-in-law. Both his in-laws. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Taken aback, the officer swiftly ushered Ken into a room while summoning his other the other officers to make them go and investigate the scene at Ken's in-law's house. Yet, when questioned about the events leading up to the, his arrival at the police station, Ken found that he couldn't explain. He was just confused. Despite his mounting anxiety, he struggled to piece together the fragmented memories of his actions. He couldn't even remember how he even got to the police station. So Ken, like, grappled with the idea that he'd done some sort of terrible act. He knew that he'd done something terrible. He didn't remember doing it. He just knew that something had happened. And as he was going into the police station, it was as if he was coming to terms with the fact that he'd done something. Yeah. He just couldn't remember what he's done. Kenneth James Park's upbringing was far from idyllic. He was raised in Toronto by his mother and his two brothers after his father's departure from the family when he was at the tender age of four. Ken struggled to find stability in his family life. His mother's marriage a few years later to his, ste his stepdad didn't help things. He wasn't close at all with his stepdad. The relationship with his mother and stepfather were ve was very, very strained as he was growing up. 
and he didn't really have much contact with his biological father either. When he was 15, where he was living so with his mother and stepdad, they all uprooted and moved to a different town, whereas Ken opted to stay behind with his grandparents in Toronto, so he didn't want to go with his mum. So that distanced himself further from his immediate family. And despite the complicated family life in his youth, Ken would go on to grow up pretty much a normal guy. Arguably not, though. Well, so far... <laughs> Joking, sorry. And then he would eventually go on to meet uh, a young girl called Karen Woods. So Karen had actually ran away from home at the time that they met. And like a romance novel, they fell in love. And it was all flowers and butterflies. Ken played a large part in the reconciliation between Karen and her parents. So he managed to help mend that relationship. It's nice. So the Woods family, so his father-in-law and mother-in-law, were really, really grateful of Ken. Ken and Karen married at the age of 21, and Ken was embraced by Karen's parents. So Barbara and Dennis Woods really, really liked him, and they completely accepted him into their family. Well, they've got their daughter back because of him, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Barbara, so Karen's mother affectionately nicknamed him her gentle giant because he was very, very tall, big yeah. man, but just uh yeah, teddy bear. This is all going really well. It is. Yeah. 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 So if I end it here that nothing That's bad. That's a needs nice to story. I mean apart yeah. from the I mean, first but we bit, had the start. So yeah. yeah. We already know what's coming, don't we? So What happened to Ken? I'm gonna tell y'all. So, however, despite their apparent happiness, trouble lurked underneath the facade of their relationship. I love it when she gets poetic. Yeah. Ken was introduced to gambling by some of his friends. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. No. And Ken found himself drawn in by the rush of horse racing. I understand that, though. I understand. I think it's chasing the win, isn't it? I Listen, when I came over to France last time, we went to the trotting thing and I won loads. I won like 30 euros. Loads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. For a bet of a, a euro. Yeah. I can see how people... Yeah. I was buzzing, mate. I was like, yeah. Addicted. Addicted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can see how it happens. Yeah. So, yeah, he just became obsessed with chasing that win. As his, as his obsession deepened, so do, too did his financial wars, even to the point of forging Karen's signature to oh, fuel no. his addiction. Oh, fuck. Oh, Ken. It's all gone downhill. All this is going downhill while Karen gave him the good news that she's expecting. And oh, they're going to have a newborn soon. Perfect timing. Yeah. yeah. One gamble too far, some would say. Yeah. So getting worse and worse, <laughs> broke and desperate, Ken began embezzling money at work. But how brazen are people to embezzle money from work? Like, do you think you're not going to get caught? No. Well, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> no, I don't think I'm going to get caught. But yeah. I have a really bad guilty face. You can kind of tell straight away. I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> I know somebody that knows somebody that did that. And like, they got away with quite a lot before they got caught. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll see. So does Ken. So broken, desperate, Ken began embezzling money at work. He justified it somehow because of the major strain his employers placed on him so it was like meh you're making me do all this stuff you know my job yeah but you're i'm gonna me steal <laughs> i'm gonna yeah. steal money from you should have been paid more so i took it instead. he was at work a lot you'll see in a minute he was at work yeah, a lot to have more options to steal money yeah it's like yeah you all leave and i i, I won't steal anything innocent face mm. i'll put the money in the safe of my car so Ken, who had always been a deep sleeper, struggled to sleep. 
and usually only manage to nod off between 1 and 2.30 a.m., so like an hour and a half of sleep a night. It's not enough. No, it's not enough. (laughs) He'd sleep for four to six hours a night uh, maximum and then go to work. I was going to say six hours. That ain't that bad. That's normally why I'm sleep. not great. Five hours sleep. Love five, it. Five, yeah, six hours. Proper, proper night. But it was all very broken. He'd wake up a lot. So in December 1986, during Ken's like complete downward spiral, Karen gave birth to their daughter. Ken hoped that he could start providing her with a lovely stable home. However, pressure kept mounting. As any parent of a newborn baby knows, there's not a lot of sleep involved when you have a newborn. So an already very tired Ken was getting even more tired. See, he often went full nights without sleep. Exhausted and stressed, he began to experience sharp headaches, which he took Tylenol. He has always had issues with sleep, like getting up, walking around, sleepwalking, stuff like that, and this is just getting worse. By March 1987, he had embezzled more than $30,000 from oh, work, fuck. and this is in the 80s, so... That's why That's a lot of money now. That's yeah. a lot of money then. Fuck. Ken! So, yeah, $30,000 in now money, and back in the 80s money, that was like 100 Billion dollars. Do, 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 do. Yeah. When his employers eventually found out about the fraud, he was fired with immediate effect. Yeah, understandable. I mean, they definitely should have been more on their finances, though. Yeah, because that, that's months. Yeah, you'd, you'd notice 30 grand not being there. Yeah, sure will So yeah, so when his employers found out, he was fired with immediate effect and charged with theft. Fair enough. The company did not want to take Ken to court. They just wanted their money back, which I thought, that's nice. They did. They could have completely taken him to the cleaners, taken him and got him in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, they... He's a, a likeable man and uh, they knew that he had a baby um just been born. It would be bad press on their part as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Obviously, Ken could no longer keep his gambling addiction a secret from Karen, so he mustered the courage to come clean. And despite Karen's disappointment, her love for Ken overshadowed her frustration. Crazy bitch. She recognised his desire to rectify the situation. Together, they made the difficult decision to sell their home as a means to address their mounting debts. And compelled by the financial strain... Karen was made to return to work, leaving their newborn baby at only a few months old. So she had to go back to work really, really quickly. Karen seems like she's very understanding. Karen's a mug. <laughs> <gasps> Karen. Yeah, I think it's because she kind of sees him as her saviour kind of thing. So All the good he did, he undid, in my opinion. Yeah. She should have said, Ken, knuff is knuff. <laughs> I'm not going to stop saying that. I'm sorry. <laughs> enough is enough, Ken. <laughs> Karen has gone back to work. Obviously, there was tension in the marital home. She didn't just let it all go. She was yeah, pissed she's off. She's grumbling. Yeah, she's having a grumble. Absolutely. She's like, I'm going to keep an eye on you, Ken. Yeah, Ken. Yeah. So this led to Ken being withdrawn and, you know, depressed about the whole situation, which is understandable. Diddums! Diddums. Yeah. Yeah. Got no sympathy, mate. Um, Determined to turn his life around, Ken attempted to abstain from gambling and steer clear from the races for good. Yep. Good boy, Ken. Yeah. However... The grip of his addictions made him come crawling back to the races. Oh, fucking addictions. Yeah, it, his addiction just proved too much and that was drawing him back into its clutches. Desperate for a win, yet each gamble only deepened their troubles. Ken once again started to Yeah, but that's the forge. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It's just, I need that win. Just one, yeah, he's one just, win. Yeah, he's just fine. thinking, just one if win. I win, 
that's it. We've got no more problems. Well, and that's that's where the issue lies. Yes. It does lie. He once again starts to forge Karen's signatures and everything to fuel his addiction. He's gone straight back into old bad habits. Oh, Kenny boy. Mm. On the 15th of May, Ken went into the emergency room at his nearest hospital, complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, a dry cough, vomiting. He was tested and had a chest x-ray, ECG and bloods, and they all came back the same day. And he was sent home. Everything was fine. Uh, yet his gambling was out of control. The embezzlement case against him was looming and obviously very, very stressful. He was not sleeping. So it's fair to assume that his health concerns were due to anxiety. I was going to say that sounds like a panic attack. Yeah. It was time to have a look in the mirror. And after his trip to the ER, Ken was ready to admit that he was an addict. His first Gamblers Anonymous meeting was on the 20th of May, and he was determined to sort himself out. His counsellors advised him to inform his entire family of the crisis that he was experiencing. Ken agreed that it was time to come clean about the extent of his gambling addiction and their financial problems it had caused. Sharing is a problem halved. Is that not what you say? What? Is, do we not say sharing a problem is a problem halved or something like that? A problem shared is a problem halved. There we are, that's the one. <laughs> Thank you. He arranged to meet his grandmother on Saturday the 23rd of May to tell her. Then he planned a barbecue at Barbara and Dennis's house for the Sunday lunch, where he planned a barbecue? on... barbecue? Like, yeah. that feels like... Surprise! <laughs> Nicking all your money! I've got a gambling addiction. <laughs> Have a burger! <laughs> We're going to lose the house! Salad? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he was going to tell his grandma on the Saturday and then tell his in-laws on the Sunday. So it was going to be a rather chaotic weekend. It's going to suck, yeah, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to suck. And Ken was very, very nervous about how everyone would react. They're not going to be happy. No. So on the night before, Friday night, the 22nd of May, he did not sleep a wink. He was up all night stressing about the bombshell that was about to land on his loved ones. By the next morning, he did not feel up to the emotional task of talking to his grandmother and told wow. Karen that he would do it the next day. Invite her to the barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. An extra Just person. get it all out of the way at once. Yeah. On the Saturday. So instead, on the Saturday, he looked outside. The sun was shining. So he decided to meet up with some friends for a game of rugby. As you do when your family's in crisis. Yes. When Ken returned home around 2.30 in the afternoon, Karen was furious. <laughs> She oh dear. was like, how could you go out and play sports when our life is in ruins because of you? He promised her that he would speak to his grandma and then he just completely chickened out and made other plans. What, so the barbecue didn't happen? No. No, it didn't happen. So Ken was just completely avoiding his responsibilities, leaving Karen heartbroken and losing hope as she grappled with the possibility that things would just not get better. The relationship had reached a boiling point and later that night it all erupted into a really heated argument about his gambling addiction, the necessity of selling their home and his persistent avoidance of accountability for his actions. So she has had enough. I make her right. I've had enough of him. I don't even know the geezer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> After the end of their argument, Karen went to work at 4.30pm, leaving her baby with Ken. Ken had his dinner, then he fed his baby daughter, bathed her and put her to sleep at around 8.30pm. Ken for the win. Once she was sound asleep, he went into the living room and watched TV until about 9.30 or 10.30, which is when Karen came home. Karen then sat next to him. They watched TV together until around midnight. Then she went off to bed. She left Ken on the couch watching TV as he said that he wouldn't be able to sleep yet. The last show that he said that he remembered was Saturday Night Live at 1.30am. The next thing he saw was a glimpse of his mother-in-law's face. Her mouth and eyes were wide open 
and she had a terrified expression. He heard Karen's younger siblings screaming upstairs in their family home. His memory became sketchy at this point, and he half recalled going back upstairs to calm the teenagers down, saying, Kids! Kids! Then, in a flash, all of a sudden he was inside of his car, covered in blood. He had a knife in his hand and immediately, like, tossed it aside. Confused and bewildered, he instinctively drove to the nearest police station. So that's where we get to the point where we were at the beginning of the story. So the police rushed to Barbara and Dennis's address, where they found Barbara and Wood's body in her bed. She had been struck with a tire iron and stabbed four times. What the fuck? Why? Well, we'll get sorry. to it in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just yeah, getting no, to, it's... I'm, like, I'm into it. Exactly. Well, d- um, Ken doesn't even know why at the minute. Dennis Woods was unconscious but still alive, but he had been badly beaten. Ken was horrified when he learned about Barbara's brutal murder, and he had absolutely no recollection of bludgering his mother-in-law to death. That's unfortunate. Yeah, he may claim that he must have done it while he was sleeping. He could not say how he drove there and he could not remember the trip at all. He was unable to provide details like whether the keys were in the car, when he left the woods home or not. He, you know, he, he could not say which route he took. His first coherent memories came after being in the police station for a couple of minutes. Police took Ken into custody and accompanied him to Sunnybrook Medical Centre as he had very, very bad injuries to his hands, to the point that he actually stayed in hospital for three days. When he was discharged, he was taken to, well, taken to jail at Toronto East Detention Centre. Ken continued to insist that he knew nothing about the murders on how he came to be at the police station covered in blood. No one believed him and he was charged with first degree murder and attempted murder. Ken's lawyer, Marlies Edward, came to meet him at the police station soon after his arrest and realised her client honestly had no idea what he had done. She arranged for a psychologist to come and examine him and he too concluded that Ken was in a state of confusion and had no idea what had actually happened. Uh, she said that Ken had a history of sleepwalking and like put that forward to the police and the fact that he didn't actually know what he was doing and that they shouldn't go after him for first-degree murder. Police were able to establish what happened in the early morning of Sunday, the 24th of May, 1987. So after falling asleep on the couch in front of the TV... Ken got up, put on his shoes and left the house without locking the door. This was very unusual for Ken, seeing as he always made a point of locking doors behind him. He walked from the door, got into his car and drove 23 kilometres, so around 14 miles, from his home in Pickering, Ontario, to his wife's parents' house in Scarborough. This trip took between 10 and 15 minutes and there are three traffic lights en route. He used the spare key they had given him to let himself into the house, carrying a tire iron. Ken walked straight upstairs to the bedroom where Barbara and Dennis were asleep in bed and launched an unprovoked attack. He attacked Dennis first, choking him, which rendered him unconscious. Dennis also received stab wounds, with Dennis fighting for his life and unconscious then. Ken then turned to Barbara and hit her with a tire iron with one hand and then stabbed her four times with her own kitchen knife. When he stabbed her, the knife went through her heart, which killed her. Then covered with blood, Ken walked through the passageway. This is a horrible... Well, it's all horrible, but this is very horrible. So Karen's younger sisters still lived in the family home and they were upstairs and they could hear everything going on. So covered with blood... Ken walked through the passageway and headed back downstairs. And that's when Barbara and Dennis's teenage daughters were cowering in fear inside of their bedrooms. They heard heavy breathing and loud grunting and like an animalistic sound that scared them. Fucking So he was like grunting and and then like making noises like like an animal. I don't like that at all. But for Ken, he said he was hushing, like trying to reassure the children, like kids, kids. He, that's what he said that he, he remembers saying. 
But yeah, but if he was asleep, he thinks he's saying that, but it's not what's coming out. This is so weird. Horrible, isn't kids, it? Kids, kids, calm down. It's fine. I've just murdered, just murdered your, your parents. It's, not. it's fine. Oh, bless them. He's just gone. He's mental, right? He's I don't know. just completely it, it, sleep deprived and he's gone fucking mental. Karen, bless her, could not believe that her kind hearted husband could ever harm anyone, let alone her parents. It just simply did not make sense. He loved them. They had a good relationship. Yeah. A remorseful Ken begged for her forgiveness and promised that he could not remember most of it. He stood to gain nothing from their deaths. You know, like, it wasn't him that was going to gain any money from them being dead. No, no, there's absolutely no motive. Nothing to gain whatsoever. So even on the gambling side... If he wanted to get money, he would have had to have taken the sisters out as well, because then all the money would have gone to Karen. Yeah. But even so, they, they didn't have a lot of money. They weren't rich. Could it be conceivable that Ken committed a violent murder while in the state of sleep, while sleepwalking? Initially, sleep specialists greeted the notion with scepticism. Sleepwalking is a phenomenon affecting 3.6% of adults in the US, according to a 2012 study. Sleepwalking is characterised where individuals navigate through space without awareness of their actions or recognition of others. Hereditary factors and external stressors like sleep deprivation or alcohol use can exacerbate sleepwalking episodes. During the investigation into Barbara Ann Woods' murder, Experts conducted sleep tests on Ken Parks, revealing irregular EEG readings indicative of disrupted sleep patterns. An abnormality suggested that Ken's brain attempted to wake up 10 to 20 times a night, straight from stage 3, slow wave sleep. So he goes straight from real deep sleep to being awake. Furthermore, Ken's cellmates attested to his nocturnal episodes during which he appeared to be asleep despite sitting up and mumbling for a brief period. Can't be doing with sleepwalking. Get horrible, isn't it? It's awful. Also, why would Ken just walk into a police station if he'd just committed murder? Ken expressed remorse and horror at the events, cooperating fully with authorities from the get-go. His genuine grief and lack of motive just completely baffled well, everyone. During Ken's 1989 trial, Karen stood by his side, oh. testifying to the, his history of sleep irregularities and lack of motive for harm. Dennis Woods, who did survive, corroborated his state of unawareness during the attack, affirming their amical relationship prior to the incident he just doesn't see why ken would purposely do anything like that can i just say that these people are fucking lovely because they're kind of on his side even though he's murdered the wife and mother yeah mm. they're still like saying this is not like him and you know they're yeah kudos mm. I've never said that word in my life. I don't know why I just said it now. Kudos to them. K kudos to them. <laughs> Neurological experts supported this defense contention, asserting Ken's lack of physiological pathology, confirming that he wasn't in a state that he could purposely commit murder. He wasn't doing it on purpose. However, the prosecution challenged Ken's actions with the time frame, arguing against the defence assertion of inadvertent murder. They're like, no, normally when you're sleepwalking, it only you only lasts between ten and up to forty minutes, which like a twenty minute drive, then a murder, and then drive to a police station in under forty minutes is cutting it tight. Yeah. So they're saying that no, that he did it on purpose. However, the jury would reach a unanimous verdict of not guilty and he, would, he actually would be acquitted on the 27th of August, 1992. So he was yeah. actually acquitted Wild. of the murder. That's Mental. Mad. But oh, I'm torn. I'm torn. Go on. Keep going. When I first started this, I was like, whatever. Not believing it at all. 
but yeah, Ken Ken was was free to go. Ken and Karen stayed married. Whoa, fuck. What? Yeah. However, they would divorce about four years after his acquittal. So it's quite a long time after the murder, but about four years after the acquittal, they would eventually divorce. He yes. remarried and eventually had five more children. And yeah, he's just still mulling around being Ken. And um, I think he got help. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't somebody like treating his sleep issues? He had, yeah, he had to be followed by like um, sleep specialists and make sure that he wasn't going to do anything. How could you sleep with someone uh, exactly. that's done that in their sleep? It's wild. You, I'd be so scared. Well, I couldn't. There's no way. There is no possible way that I would ever be anywhere near anybody that did that in their sleep. Yeah. Anyway, that is the case of Kenneth Parks, the sleepwalk murderer. Thanks, Bex. I hope you all sleep well tonight. I just can't get my head. Especially if you're with other people in the house. Who sleepwalk? Who sleep. Or don't. Uh. I have sleep issues. Um, I've got to go and get tested for sleep apnea and I talk. I snore terribly. I grind my teeth like uh, there's no tomorrow. It's horrendous. And um, I speak in my sleep a lot, but... Oh, I do. I think Ben would probably leave if I started getting up and about going, I've got a pet crocodile called Bruce. Because that's the kind of shit I say. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Is that what you've heard, been heard to have said before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I say all sorts of crazy shit. I think uh, the other night I woke him up to tell him that it's not the clouds that are moving. It's us. Very deep. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, yeah. a child coming in. It's not the child. It's not the clouds that are moving. It's us. <laughs> and then your eye go into the side like... <laughs> no is mine do it if i do that no they both go in uh, just go in yeah they're going in is that working no you're literally doing nothing becky doing nothing is happening hold on <laughs> i can't do it now let's just keep going because it's late what are you trying to do me and my eye go to the side you can't just move one eye you can <laughs> is it not going off to the side no, you're it. just like, you're like this. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it doing it? <laughs> They're not even moving. They're not even moving. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because the light is so bright. It's not the light, you just can't do it. Yeah, I can. Don't tell me that I can't. You can't move one eye without the other you one. Can. Some people can. <laughs> Becky can't. Be- Becky's not one of them. I can do it. I just can't um, do it. Oh, go, go on then. One more try if you want. No, if no sure. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> go on. <laughs> no, I'm laughing now. C'est bon. I'm I'll doing send it. you a video if I can do it. I'm doing it. <laughs> it's what I was doing. No, I reckon you can look at the video and be like, actually, she was doing it. Working. You were. You weren't moving. And nothing. Anyway, right. Come on, because my throat's hurting so much. And I'm not even talking. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Becky's still trying to do it. Oh, I saw it move, Becky. <laughs> I saw it move. Becky's eye thing is the opposite of when I say to my children, don't roll your eyes at me. And they say, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Becky's literally like, I did! I did! I did! It was me! <laughs> that is definitely going to be made into a clip anyway. No, it's not! You can't do that. It definitely That's is. <laughs> it definitely is. That's hilarious. I'm really close to the camera as well. I'm like, <laughs> not doing anything. Yeah, my eye moved to the side. You're just jealous because you can't do <laughs> Right, let's go. Let's get spooky. It's not even that spooky, actually, to be fair, but it's a very interesting story. So this week I'm going to talk about the Saoshi 
or Sochi poltergeist. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, and I should p- probably looked it up. A running theme of this podcast. <laughs> uh, Sochi, so it's somewhere in Scotland. It's a town in Scotland. Ah, I'm going to go with Sochi. I am brew. That was no, that was good. Glasgow. <laughs> that was terrible, Tash. Glasgow. You sound like the man that used to work at my corner shop when I used to live in England. All I can hear, I don't know what she's saying, but all I can hear is her going. <laughs> I heard <laughs> oh mad, I heard oh Mardi Gras, oh, like Mardi Gras. <laughs> Scottish people can't say purple burglar alarm. Neither can you, darling. <laughs> no, I can. <laughs> Scottish people can't see even less than I can. Purple burglar alarm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's move on. You, you, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's definitely <laughs> that is not Scottish. Not the, not the accent that you're going for. <laughs> Listen, I can do an Australian shark. I yeah. cannot do Scottish. I can do like one word, and then that's it. There was this rumour going around, like, the podcast space that Tash was actually really good at Scottish accents, <laughs> but now we have no. definite proof. Proof. Sorry, guys. She can't. Sorry, yeah, she can't do can't it. Can't do it. Lots of legends get like, getting uh, proven wrong. I can't make my eye move <laughs> one way. She can't do and it. Tash can't say, can't do a, a Scottish accent. Can't. No. And Becky cannot also say Ken. <laughs> she can't no. say it. Tune in for Emma's story to see what she can't do. <laughs> I, it depends how well I edit the podcast, but this is definitely staying in. Just so you all know, we had pen. This is pen. <laughs> oh, can't, you did a, like some kind of... Sten. Sten, I think Sten, Sten was yeah. there. Yeah, never Ken. It's three letters, mate. <laughs> three letters. It's th- three, three very awkward letters. Three, three. Three. So free with F. Right, give me the story. <laughs> We're going. Mm. I think we use the term poltergeist too loosely. That's what I think. As soon as objects are moved, it's called poltergeist activity. The true meaning of poltergeist, however, is not that of a ghost or spirit. In fact, poltergeists were never of the human world. They are associated with young people, most often girls, going through puberty. Poltergeists are for sure paranormal, meaning that they're beyond what's normal. Mm -hmm. But the exact definition does not mean that they are sentient or evil spirits sent to haunt, but more an unconscious manifestation of a troubled mind. Many people believe that poltergeists are malevolent and mischievous spirits that were once possibly not the nicest people like fred the black monk of pontefract Mm -hmm. but in my story this week we'll be talking about a poltergeist that truly sticks to its primary definition and proves how powerful and scary the human mind can be Mm. 11 year old virginia campbell moved to scotland in october of 1960 She was the baby of the family. All her other siblings had left home previous to the move. Her parents were in their 60s, so there was a big age gap between Virginia and her brothers and sisters, making her childhood lonely. Oh, that's sad. I can actually relate, because I had um, an older dad. I've got a massive age gap between his children, and I've got quite a substantial age gap with my siblings on my mum's side, and... You know, they're lovely and, you know, we all get on, but I never had anybody to play with because they were all past that kind of stage. You know, my my sister who's closest to me in age is six years older than me. So, you know, when I was six and wanting to play, she was 12 and, you know, thinking she was too cool for school. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of, I, I can, I can relate. They'd lived in a very rural area in Ireland, and her only two friends were her dog, Toby. I 
can also relate because I had a dog called Toby. Oh, I remember Aww. Toby. Toby was the best he dog. He was so lovely. And another little girl called Annie. The move to Scotland was made even more difficult because her father had to stay behind to sell the family farm. Toby, her dog, had not moved with them. And her and her mother had had to move into her aunt's house in a village called Soushi. The house was small and Virginia was made to share her bed with her cousin Margaret. Her mother found work in another town and to avoid the long commute, moved there, leaving Virginia alone with her aunt and uncle. As you might imagine, the little girl was miserable. She was extremely shy and all of a sudden she was living away from her parents. She'd lost her beloved dog and would soon be starting a new school. An 11-year-old's nightmare. Yeah. The first strange occurrence happened on November 22nd. Margaret and Virginia had gone to bed and had begun to hear a strange scratching noise. They had shouted down to Margaret's parents who just replied they were imagining it and had to go back to sleep. But a few minutes later, the girls ran downstairs in a frenzy, followed by a strange thudding sound like a big rubber ball bouncing behind them. The parents heard the odd sound, but thought the girls were playing a joke on them, so went and took them back into bed. When they checked on them a few minutes later, they too could clearly hear a banging noise coming from the girls' headboard. They decided to change the girls into another bed, but as soon as they were getting comfortable, the banging started on that headboard too. It only stopped once little Virginia finally fell asleep. How could she fall asleep without going on? Kids, they can fall asleep whenever they want, can't they? My issue is, why is she being made to sleep with Margaret if there's a spare bed? Why couldn't they each have a different bed? Maybe... They didn't want to heat the rooms. A different bed in the same room or? No different room. Mm. So they technically they both could have had a room, but you know, yeah. Tasha's got a point. Maybe they couldn't afford to um, heat both rooms. That's fair enough. The next night, the same sound could be heard. Margaret had run terrified from her room. Virginia's aunt and uncle suspected this was all a ruse so that Virginia could have the bed to herself. However, when the noise continued after telling her off, they became as afraid as Margaret and thought it might be good to ask the local priest to come and check things out. Reverend Lund came to visit the house just after midnight. What a dude. He, like, gets a call late at night and he's like, yeah, I'm on on my way. Just come round. I'm there. Yeah. Stand up. Stand up, Reverend. Yeah. Yeah. He suspected it was just Virginia playing up as she was unhappy with her present situation. He too heard the bizarre sounds and asked Virginia to move down the bed so her head was no longer in contact with the headboard. The banging continued. He then placed his hand on the headboard and felt it vibrate. It was then that everyone realised that the sound wasn't coming from behind the bed, but from the bed itself. Haunted bed. Yeah. Yeah. But it's wherever Virginia goes, because it was one bed and then it was another bed. I mean, she's a prime candidate, isn't she? She is, yeah. But, okay, we could probably find some logical explanation for these bangs. I'm never truly convinced by the banging and scratching. But just as in other cases, this was only the beginning of what was happening to poor Virginia. As the Reverend, Margaret, Virginia and her aunt and uncle all watched, a heavy linen closet that was near the bed began to topple back and forth, inching its way closer and closer to the bed. Ooh. It even lifted off the ground completely at one point. Then it stopped and started to make its own way back to its normal place. Everyone in the room was frozen with fear. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that something supernatural was going on. Well, yeah, moving furniture. Yeah. can see why people believe that. You're not doing that with a bit of fishing wire, are you? No. Or are so- you? Or oh, is he? No, no, I know he's not. I was just being funny, sorry. <laughs> she was like, she was going to beat you up then, Tash. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Tash. No. You what? <laughs> 
Somehow the Reverend managed to calm everyone down and got the girls back into bed. But as soon as Margaret joined Virginia, the knocking intensified and became very insistent, almost like it was saying it didn't want Margaret in the bed. And sure enough, when they moved her into another room, the knocking stopped and both girls fell asleep. From that night on, things began to get stranger and stranger. One day, the family watched, stunned as an apple floated out of the fruit bowl and across the room. Some china vases started moving around by themselves. The sewing machine would turn itself on and start sewing when no one was anywhere near it. But all this was nothing compared what, to what was about to happen in the next week. Do you know what annoys me about poltergeists? Why don't they ever do the laundry? Fold some They're socks. All opening cupboards, all the kitchen cupboards. Yeah. Empty the dishwasher. Yeah, but the thing is, if we're going on the pure definition of poltergeist, it's actually the person who the poltergeist is attached to who is creating the poltergeist. The poltergeist is not a sentient ghost. Okay. It's the energy surrounding the, well, in this case, the little girl. That energy could still do the dishwasher, mow the grass. Could do, but I don't Put think the bins they out. have it. Oh, and it kind of sounds like an excuse, like, that my um, husband would be like, oh, I couldn't do this because the energy was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the poltergeist just wanted me to sit and game and stretch. Yeah. Oh, he's just telling me to game. It was a gaming energy. <laughs> Virginia had been kept off school for three days because of all the upset, but when she went back, as she came home, the reverend was waiting for her to see if it had all gone well. She replied that it had been fine, but there was one odd thing that had happened. Whilst the teacher had been standing next to her, the lid of another pupil's desk had lifted up by itself. However... A.R.G. Owen, a researcher who was investigating the Sochi poltergeist later, interviewed Virginia's teacher, who had a much more detailed account about what had happened that day. She said that she watched Virginia's desk lid open three times whilst her hands were on top of it as if she was fighting to keep it closed. Miss Stewart, the teacher, went over to see if the child could have been lifting it with her knees and saw that there was just no way she could. She stared at Virginia as if to say, stop it, you know, that look of yeah. pack it in. And Virginia just stared blankly right back at her. Then a girl behind her asked if she could return a book she had borrowed from the library and left her desk for a while. While she was gone, Miss Stewart saw her desk lift up by itself and float in the air for a few seconds, about an inch off the floor, before gently floating back down. She then quickly searched for strings or something that could have made the, de the desk move. But all she found was a normal desk. None of the other students had noticed the desk move and were all very confused at why their teacher was inspecting an empty desk. Trying to play it cool, Miss Stewart then turned to Virginia and asked, Are you feeling better now? To which Virginia replied, There's nothing wrong with me. Mm. It's a bit, a bit weird, isn't it? Mm. There's nothing wrong with me. Just imagine her head rotating, <laughs> can't you? There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Three days later, the teacher stated that Virginia approached her desk and as she did, the blackboard pointer began to vibrate and move until it slid off her desk and fell to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> we are children. You said the word vibrate and Tasha's eyebrow went mental. <laughs> it was like, hey, 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 vibrate, vibrate. <laughs> Is it because it's like uh, something that you could... <laughs> Insert. Just the energy, it's the energy, Emma. It's the energy. <laughs> the energy's changed in the room and, and uh, yeah, it just made me laugh. Okay, so we have a vibrating blackboard pointer. <sighs> so the blackboard pointer began to vibrate and move until it slid off her desk and fell to the floor. The teacher's desk also began to vibrate and move. It lifted and span counterclockwise away from Miss Stewart. She looked at Virginia, who was a few feet away and who was visibly upset. It's not me, I'm not doing it, she cried. 
It's fine, the teacher replied. Just help me straighten the desk. Virginia was obviously struggling mentally with all that was happening, and so the local doctor dropped in to check on her. He brought his little dog, who Virginia immediately fell in love with, saying how much he looked like her dog, Toby. Oh, bless her. Yeah, and how much she missed him. The doctor left along with his dog, thinking all seemed well, but that night little Virginia entered a trance, screaming and crying for her dog Toby and her friend Annie. Reverend Lund, who was visiting that night and just so happened to have brought the little girl a teddy bear, so he went up and put the teddy bear in her arms, thinking that it might comfort her, and it did for a while until she noticed the eyes and nose were buttons. And she threw it across the room, shouting, That's not Toby! She then began to hit the reverend and flail about the room <laughs> hysterically. <laughs> ah! <laughs> not the brothers! <laughs> Flail's such a good word, isn't it? Ah! Flailing. <laughs> oh, it's a bit like Coraline with the buttons, though. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Well, it's a teddy bear, so... Yeah. She then began to hit the reverend and flail about the room hysterically, still in a trance-like state. Her aunt and uncle and the reverend all left the room, leaving her to calm down by herself, which seems a bit weird to me, but hey-ho. Like, oh yeah, she's obviously in some kind of weird trance and she's just running around the room hysterically. I'm going to take care of that. I'm shutting the door on this issue. She'll be all right. Yeah. (laughs) See you, see you in a bit. Bye. You, no, she'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> the poltergeist soon became local news with everyone gossiping about little Virginia and her ghost. On the 1st of December, Reverend Lund, along with three other ministers, performed a religious service in Virginia's room to try and calm things down. And it did. Well done. The poltergeist became less frightening and the activity was less frequent. Virginia got so used to the odd object moving by itself, she gave the poltergeist a name, Wee Huey. Hmm. Okay. Because this poltergeist was less scary, the girls began to think it was kind of convenient that, the, the, you know, they could steal some sweets and say, what, me? No, it was Wee Huey. Wee Huey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Toby, the beloved dog, was reunited with the little girl, which I was happy oh, about yay. because I, I thought we weren't going to see Toby again, but he comes back. Oh, we love Toby. He was reunited with the little girl and by March of the next year, all activity had completely stopped. The Sochi poltergeist for me is a case that most definitely connects the poor mental health of a young girl directly with supernatural occurrences. But the mind boggles to know exactly what is happening in this, these instances. Is it possible but that we are able to access parts of our brain that make telekinesis possible in times of despair? So telekinesis is where you can move things with your mind? Yeah, like Matilda. Yes, or Carrie. I'm trying to think of something else, yes. but I can't think. Can't think. Or the guy who does the spoon bending. But oh, yeah, he, what's wasn't his name? he found out to be a... R- Yuri Geller? Yuri Geller? Yes. No, wasn't Yuri Geller... No, hold on. Wasn't Yuri Geller a um, football coach? <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, I think no. Yuri Geller is a... Uh, was this bendy spoon guy. Maybe we should look on Google. It could... To be fair, with that name, it could definitely be both. <laughs> Yuri Geller... Yeah, that's him. Yeah, it's a spoon guy. Oh, wait, look. Exit City Takeover finally seen. Both of you were right. We were both right. Yay! I'm so happy with myself right now. <laughs> I'm so proud of both of you. Anyway, I, th- I think he was found out to be a fraud, but yeah. The whole thing is massively creepy and somewhat terrifying, as it's, I will at some point, have two teenage girls under the same roof. That's scary enough as it is. Yeah, but they can move stuff with their fucking mind. If anyone's kid's going to do it, Emma, it's yours. Yeah, <laughs> they are They are creepy. Oh, the, mummy, the you, don't want me to get, you don't want to get me another kitty? Well, 
I will make your <laughs> furniture move. What's this, bitch? <laughs> Look at all the spoons. Now they're all bent. No more tea for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my little un, she said something. So we have the best conversations. So I'm driving her to school and she goes, so my little un's five. She goes, mummy, what's your least favorite liquid? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh kids. <laughs> I know what mine is. <laughs> Urine. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't that. But, yeah, that's also up there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But I wasn't, I didn't it's know where the conversation was going. So <laughs> I go, I don't know, sweetheart, which one's yours? <laughs> she goes, lava. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's pretty, pretty understandable one to not like. That's lava. <laughs> lava. Mine is lava. <laughs> oh, I bet she learned you know, that lava was a liquid and she was like, that's my least favourite liquid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I love her. Uh, and then she goes... Yeah, that's why I don't like the colour red, because it reminds me of lava. <laughs> and also... so angry about it. I'm so angry about lava. And also, demons. Demons. <laughs> I didn't know demons were liquid. But... No! Demons are red, apparently. No, hang on. She goes, yeah, that's why I don't like the colour red, because of lava. And also, it reminds me of demons. And I don't like demons. <laughs> I was like, I mean, listen, it, it's, she's not wrong. She's, it all goes hand in hand. She's five. I just love the thought process. It was just, I bet she was watching someone on telly or like YouTube and it was like, lava is a liquid. When liquid, when rock gets so hot, uh, gets so hot it turns into a liquid. And then I bet she was like, oh, I hate that. <laughs> 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 and she was like, and it's red. Nah. <laughs> it's just kids are wild because if anyone ever said to me name a liquid i would never ever say lava no i just wouldn't ever say it i didn't that know where the even... conversation was going what's your <laughs> least favorite liquid oh, di- diarrhea <laughs> diarrhea <laughs> sucks it's also good oh. <laughs> anyway like sewage like yeah, there's so many that's... like oh dear I it's wasn't th- I wasn't thinking lava. <laughs> I think I would My have guessed 200 things before I would have guessed lava. <laughs> yes, yeah, And she was same. so outraged. Lava. <laughs> <laughs> Mention lava to me again. <laughs> lava. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, that's my story. Oh, for the so week. funny! Oh, I don't know how we got you. onto that, but it was so fun. <laughs> well, the fact that we've all got teenage, we've all got girls oh, yeah. that are going to oh, be yeah. teenagers, yeah. and uh... my kids are especially creepy. I will one day have a teenage boy living in my house. So oh. that's also pretty disgusting. <laughs> I mean, just smelly, smelly. Yeah, smelly boys. And also, though, less less likely to make cupboards float around. Yeah, maybe. I tell you what, if that shit starts happening, she's going to stay with her auntie Becky or her auntie Tash. Oh. Go on holiday and see. Go see your auntie Tash. Oh well, I live in a new build, so I feel like that. Yeah, they has got nothing less to do with that. It's got nothing oh, to do sure with that. That's what I'm telling myself. Listen, it's... I'm saying I'll take her for you. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> It's that so, angst. It's like all this fucking angst and hormones and they're just like, Arr! vibrate, blackboard pointer. Ooh. Yeah. Right. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening. You can catch us in all the usual places, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Um, you can email Becky. Twitter. Twitter, X. X. And you can um, email Becky. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And please share with your friends. Leave us a little comment. Leave us a review. We want to hear what you've got to say. Mm-hmm. 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 Everything that she said. Yeah. What she said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. Yeah. Stay safe. Don't kill people. And keep it weird. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Sorry if you heard me swallow. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people have. <laughs> right. Sorry to spit. That's gross. <laughs> Is it? Not many people. Anyway, let's uh, cut that out and get going. His body cloaked in blood. Cloaked? He... Cloaked? Do like, you mean everywhere. coated? Blood. Like, oh, yeah. coated? <laughs> Coated. <laughs> his body coated in blood covered animals say covered his body covered in blood i mean d- cloak is a type of coat to be fair and pen pen ken gen gen ken began concluded that sten sten oh fucking hell she's using some very fancy words becky yeah i really regret doing it now Hmm. Hold on. <laughs> I mean, Damn it. Why did I think I was going to be clever that night? Yeah. Why do I think that he has past, past 11 o'clock at night now? Um, 